reviews my name is Alyssa and this is my video for ranking the nine spider-man films so I will be looking at every spider-man film and ranking it in order from what I deem to be the worst of them up through what I would consider the best of them and this is just based off of my opinion and my opinion alone there's no polls or anything like that or algorithms it's just me it's just my opinion that's all it is um i did recently do a marathon of all the spider-man films about i don't know seven or eight months ago um and i actually had never seen most of the older ones before i saw the original spider-man of sam raimi one like a long ass time ago and probably bits and pieces of spider-man 2 a while ago but uh, for a lot of those films, it was the first time I'd ever seen them. And it was really good of me to do that uh, because that prepared me for No Way Home, which, of course, I saw uh, last December when it came out about a month ago uh, from the recording of this video. So I'm going to uh, include No Way Home in this. And therefore, I must give you a huge spoiler warning. It's been a month, so you probably have seen it by now if you're watching a video about Spider-Man films. Uh, but just on the off chance you haven't seen No Way Home, I'm going to spoil the living crap out of it. <laughs> so uh, when I get to it, I'm not telling you where it is on my rankings, but it is on there somewhere. And when I get to it, I uh, will spoil the crap out of it, so make sure that you have seen it. Um, the other Spider-Man films, I'm probably going to spoil them a little bit too, but you know, they're older, whatever, okay, you know. <laughs> and some of them I don't think are worth seeing, to be perfectly honest with you. Anyways, no more rambling. Let's go ahead, I'm going to start with the number nine, which I consider to be the worst Spider-Man film, and work my way up through number one. Let's get into it now. Number nine. Number nine, number nine, number nine. And number nine, the absolute worst Spider-Man film of all time, Spider-Man 3, the third of the Sam Raimi trilogy. And Sam Raimi really should have stopped after Spider-Man 2. Spider-Man 2 was fine. There was no reason to make this absolute disaster of a movie, an absolute clusterfuck. I had never actually seen it until I did my marathon last year and man was it really difficult to sit through like it was torturous but I was determined to watch all of the Spider-Man films and ultimately for the sake of No Way Home I'm glad that I did but man this film was awful I wish I could have that two hours of my life back of course there's the famous Peter Parker turning evil and doing his ridiculous dance in the street which is absolutely laughable uh, but what I hate about this movie the most is that it tries to cram in way too many villains. Now, you could say, you know, No Way Home has a lot of villains, too. Except what No Way Home has is one main villain in the Green Goblin and other supporting characters. In this film, they try to make all of the three villains the main villain. And they just have two of them sit on the sidelines for a little while while one of them is the main villain in a certain part of the film. And they try to make Peter Parker have an emotional connection to each of these main villains. And it's, you just can't do that in a two-hour movie. What were they thinking? This is an absolute disaster. A clear money grab. And it was good that they didn't make any more Spider-Man films in this series uh, because they really jumped the shark with this one. And it is the worst Spider-Man film and number nine in my rankings. Eight, eight, eight. Not really all that great. At number eight, the second worst Spider-Man film the Amazing Spider-Man 2. This is also a pretty terrible movie. Uh, this does kind of the same thing that Spider-Man 3 tried to do, which is to cram in too many villains that just do not fit in a two-hour movie. They try to put in the Rhino, which was a silly villain anyways, and they try to suddenly introduce uh, Harry Osborn, even though the Osborns weren't really in the first movie. And then, of course, you have Electro, played by Jamie Foxx, 
who has the most ridiculous motivation for a villain I've ever seen. His motivation for becoming a villain is Spider-Man forgot his name. It's just so ridiculous. And Jamie Foxx is awful as a lecturer in this movie. It was really great to see what Jamie Foxx is capable of doing as a lecturer in No Way Home. You can see what Jamie Foxx can do with good writing and good directing, both of which were severely lacking in this film. Uh, this film also does the old girlfriend dangling from a building thing, which to be fair, the MCU does a couple times as well, but they try to be dark and edgy and different by having her die. Uh, but actually, it just really sucks, uh, which actually this was another redeeming moment for uh, No Way Home. But in this film, it is awful. Terrible, terrible movie, and it is the second worst movie in my ranking list. At number seven, The Amazing Spider-Man, the first one. So I didn't really like either of The Amazing Spider-Man movies. This was also a pretty bad movie, even if not quite as bad as The Amazing Spider-Man 2. It doesn't try to cram in too many villains, but the one villain it does have is pretty boring. Like the lizard is just not interesting at all in this film and what really drives me crazy about this film and the other amazing spider-man film as well is that andrew garfield is awful as peter parker he portrays peter parker as a dick like forget flash thompson you don't need him peter parker is the bully and i've come to realize after watching no way home that it's not andrew garfield's fault it's probably the bad writing and bad directing as i said uh, when I was talking about Electro because I actually really loved Andrew Garfield as Peter Parker in No Way Home and it made me realize he actually can play Peter Parker. He certainly cannot in the two Amazing Spider-Man films, however, as they are back-to-back -back awful films and they come in back-to-back -back on my ranking list at number eight and number seven, respectively. Number six. At number six, the original Sam Raimi Spider-Man film from 2002, starring Tobey Maguire. So this one actually represents a pretty big jump up in quality between number seven and number six, because I think that this is much better than The Amazing Spider-Man. I mean, you look at it now, it just seems like kind of the stereotypical superhero origin movie. I mean, it's very typical. It's very formulaic. Uh, in fact, uh, I often uh, compare the Sam Raimi trilogy of Spider-Man films to the first three Superman films. There's a lot of parallels. The first one is the origin story. The second one is the hero giving up his powers or giving up being a hero. The third one, they turn evil in a very, very silly way. <laughs> so they're very uh, parallel to each other. So it just speaks to just how formulaic this is as an origin story although i will say that i think this movie was better than the first superman film and i know this because i just recently rewatched that one and also i love gene hackman but lex Luthor kind of sucks in that first movie of superman whereas willem dafoe is is a better villain here although he would be much better in no way home than he is in this movie yeah this, this, this is fine this is it's kind of a classic but uh, when you compare it to superhero movies to come later, especially the MCU films, uh, it looks kind of outdated, but it's all right. Number five is a lie. Number five. And number five, Spider-Man 2, the best of the Sam Raimi Spider-Man films, in my opinion. And I think it's the best because it has the most interesting villain. All of the Sam Raimi films and the Amazing Spider-Man films tend to have more cartoonish, uh, paper-thin villains than the MCU films have. But of those villains, I definitely like Alfred Molino's Doc Ock the best. I mean, after all, he is just a regular old guy who gets taken over by these evil AI arms uh, and you can really empathize with him a lot more than some of the other villains and I think he has the best uh, rapport and the best connection 
with Peter Parker before they would try to make Peter Parker have a personal connection with three different villains in the same movie. This was when they did it correctly. Uh, there's also a very powerful scene between Peter Parker and Aunt May when Peter Parker has to confess what he did to cause Uncle Ben's death. And, uh... That, of course, is completely undercut in Spider-Man 3, but we won't talk about that right now. That, that's fine. Spider-Man 2, pretty decent movie as far as the older Spider-Man films go. And it is number five on my ranking list. Hey, what if Spider-Man joined the Fantastic Four? Number four. At number four, Spider-Man Homecoming. So I talked earlier about a big jump in quality between number seven and number six. This represents an even greater significant jump up in quality between number five and number four, as I think Spider-Man Homecoming is light years better than any of the Sam Raimi films, and definitely the Amazing Spider-Man films, as I think all of the MCU Spider-Man films are the best, as you may have noticed uh, that the top four will contain all three of the MCU films. And I just think that uh, John Watts is a much better director. I think Kevin Feige really knows what he's doing. And most of all, Tom Holland is the Spider-Man. Not the best Spider-Man, the Spider-Man. The only Spider-Man worth talking about, in my opinion. Now, uh, Homecoming is uh, the lowest ranked of the MCU films for me because Tom Holland hasn't quite come in on his own yet. He's still uh, figuring out the role of Peter Parker. I think he gets better with each successive film. And also, uh, Zendaya hasn't really come on to her own yet in this film. She's still kind of a minor character. Uh, but this is still a film that is light years better than any of the other ones before it uh, as it has the most grounded and down-to-earth villain. Uh, they don't have anything that interesting and complex in uh, the previous uh, films. Even Alfred Molina's Dr. Octopus comes nowhere close to being as interesting as the Vulture here played by Michael Keaton. Uh, so just a really great film and it just really shows how far superhero movies have come up to this point. Number three. And number three, Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse. Now, this might be a little bit of a shocker to most people that this is only at number three because I am probably the only person in the entire multiverse that would not have this as her number two or number one. I know that prior to No Way Home, most everyone would call this their number one Spider-Man film. And then after No Way Home, I would say about half of them seem to have put No Way Home ahead of it and the other half still think Into the Spider-Verse is the best film. I'm kind of just guessing that I don't really know that for sure. Uh, but I've never thought of this as my best uh, Spider-Man film, but I'll get to the reasons why for that in just a second. First, I do want to talk about how great it is and why this is actually all the way up at number three and why I consider this part of my Fantastic Four, the absolute four best Spider-Man films, the three MCU films, and this one. This one blows the doors off of any of the other Sony non-MCU Spider-Man films. So first of all, uh, it introduces Miles Morales as Spider-Man. So we're getting into something different. We're having Spider-Man uh, be a person of color, uh, which I guess that character had already been introduced in the comics, but had never before see been seen on the big screen. And I like the alternate universe. Older Peter Parker is kind of the mentor figure for him. I like the uh, Spider Gwen in this film as well. And of course, I'm always a sucker for a multiverse stories. So this was a good one. Um, now, the reason why I never consider this my best Spider-Man film is, at the end of the day, it's still kind of for kids. Like, I wanted a Spider-Verse film uh, for adults, and I think that that's what No Way Home ended up being. Um, 
I'm sorry, but it has Spider Ham in it. Also, Spider Noir, voiced by Nick Cage. Very silly. A very silly character. I don't know how I could say that this was ever the best Spider Man film when it has fucking Spider Ham in it. I don't know. The people who were complaining about that What If episode with Thor when Thor was kind of a Looney Tunes type character. Do you also think that this is the best Spider Man film? Because. Spider-Ham is literally a Looney Tunes character. I don't know. I'm not saying it's a bad movie. It's actually still one of the best Spider-Man movies of all time. I, but it's not the best. And that is why. And that is why it is number three on my list. Number two. At number two... Spider-Man Far From Home, and yes, once again, I do realize that I'm the only one in the entire multiverse that would have Far From Home ranked higher than Into the Spider-Verse, but I don't care. I just think it's a much more mature film, and it's a better character sketch, and it doesn't have fucking Spider-Ham in it, so I'm sorry. Uh, I just love the hero's journey that is undertook here by Tom Holland's Peter Parker as he is trying to get out from under the shadow of Tony Stark, who has recently departed. And I love it so much because it just feels so real, just so genuine. It's something that a lot of us can relate to because his downfall in this film is his lack of self-confidence. Uh, he's just like a normal dude. <laughs> and that is not something that I can say about Andrew Garfield's assholey Spider-Man or Tobey Maguire's too comic accurate version of Spider-Man. This is just an ordinary guy. I mean, you could also say that about Miles Morales as well, but again, Spider-Ham. <laughs> so, uh, also, I love Jake Gyllenhaal in this film. He crushes it. I've also always been a huge fan of Mysterio ever since I first saw him in Spider-Man and his amazing friends, that cartoon from the 1980s. And I absolutely love the visuals here when Mysterio is casting all of those different illusions and trapping Spider-Man in that world of illusions. It's just fantastic. An overall fantastic film. And oh, by the way, Zendaya. I love Zendaya. And she really, really steps it up in this film. Yeah, maybe I'm the only one, but I don't care. I think that Spider-Man Far From Home is the second best Spider-Man film. And now, my, my number one, one Spider-Man Spider film, film of all, of all time. time. And my number one Spider-Man film is, of course, Spider-Man No Way Home. Was there ever any doubt? So I have been a lifelong Spider-Man fan ever since I first watched Spider-Man and his amazing friends in the 1980s and then went on to read the comic books. Him and Batman have always been my top two, my favorite superheroes ever. And if you are a lifelong Spider-Man fan, as I am, it is impossible not to love this movie because this is the ultimate in Spider-Man films. I've heard it referred to as the end game of Spider-Man movies and I think that is a pretty accurate analogy. As just like an end game, there is a lot of characters and yet, just as in Endgame, they really make it work. But they do it in a very Spider-Man way. Uh, now, it does require you to have seen uh, some films outside of the MCU because you're really going to appreciate this movie more if you have seen The Amazing Spider-Man and the Sam Raimi series of films. Uh, and... This movie, though, really actually makes it worthwhile for me have, to have watched some of those really horrible movies because this film is able to redeem some of the worst parts of those films. As I mentioned before, I actually really love Andrew Garfield in this movie, even though I hated him in the Amazing Spider-Man movies, and he gets that great redemptive storyline of getting to save MJ. It was a very tender moment. And of course, Tom Holland really cements himself as the true Peter Parker in this film. And Zendaya, she's amazing. What can I say about Zendaya? Uh, but I cannot leave this video without talking about how this film is the best version of 
The with great power comes great responsibility storyline. It is essential to Spider-Man's storyline. If you understand Spider-Man, you understand that. Uh, that you cannot have his story without some version of that great power with great responsibility storyline. And the MCU to this point hadn't done it yet. And in this film, they do it far better than it has ever been done before. And not just because uh, they substitute Uncle Ben with Aunt May, but because we had two and a half movies to really get to know Aunt May and to really feel the human, genuine connection between Peter Parker and Aunt May and why Peter Parker loves her so much. Whereas in the previous two franchises, we were told that Uncle Ben is something, somebody we should care about. We were told that Uncle Ben is somebody Peter Parker really cares about. Here, we were shown why he cares about Aunt May through two and a half movies. And Marissa Tomei crushes it. She is amazing. This film is the true amazing Spider-Man film. It is the best movie in the Spider-Man franchise. Thank you so much for watching, and I will see you all soon. Goodbye.